And uh, so not only is love to be the primary motivation, but where love is the primary motivation, then we, our focus is going to be to edify. Interestingly, in this chapter, which follows on from chapter 13, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Chapter 14 follows right on from chapter 13. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> but it's, it mentions six times about edifying. So do you think God's trying to make a point? Do you think he's trying to, you know, try to uh, maybe get our attention? I think he might be, all right? And so let's have a look at some of these verses in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 3. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Edification is the first one. It's about edifying. All right, verse 4. He who speaks in the tongue edifies himself. He who prophesies edifies the church. All right? So it's not about being the star of the church, it's about edifying the church. Yeah. Verse 5. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets. Why? That the church may receive edification. So we see already, verse after verse, it's about you can do all these things and they're all important and as we saw last night, we're supposed to passionately pursue them, but it's not for any other reason than the edification of the people of God. Amen? Then verse 12. Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, which is a good thing, he tells us to be like that, but then he says, here's the, the fine tuning of your zeal. Let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Then we go to verse 17. He says, indeed, you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. He's talking about people who, who just get carried away with praying in the spirit or worshiping in the spirit and actually don't um, you know, pray in the understanding so that it builds people up. Yes. But again, it's about edification. All right? Then verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation? Let all things be done for edification. Do you know, we haven't had a big light show here this weekend. We haven't even had a fog machine. We haven't had a big study. Small video. Yeah, we've only got a small, and there's only one video. Guess what? The early church didn't have light show and fog machine and videos and the whole deal. How on earth did they cope? Hey, I'm being a bit facetious, but I think it's, you know, we've got to kind of, you know, I'm not saying that, that those things are bad. The thing is, Paul's saying, hey, you, you come with all this stuff, but make sure it's for edification. Yeah. Yeah. Not for self-glorification. Yeah. Yeah. Not for self-aggrandizement. Yeah. And I think so many of our pursuits have been for our own, you know, to make us feel good, yeah. to make us think we're the best, you know. I, I think the word best should be taken out of the, um, the vocabulary of the church today. Yes. Because we have so misused the word because of wrong things in our hearts. You know, I go to the best church in town. How can it be the best? <laughs> what we're talking about is superficial external things. We're talking about comparisons. And, it's, and the Bible says we're not to compare ourselves with each other. You know? Well, we've got the best music. We've got the best this, the best that, the best, the best, the best. Do you know what? God doesn't care. You say me. Hey, me. Sorry, but, you know, it's true. God doesn't care. Do you know, when we get to heaven, he's not going to say, hey, do you come from the best church in Brisbane? Hey, did your church have the best music? Because if so, front row for you. <laughs> I know I'm kind of putting the knife in and turning it a bit, you know, but... <laughs> this doesn't excuse us giving God yeah, our best. Amen. Right? That's right, that's right. So I'm not saying let's be daggy and let's be unorganised and, you know, let's not care. I'm not saying that at all. Man, we have to give God our best. Amen. But that's not so that we can turn around and go, we're the best. 
See, whatever we do, whatever we bring to the table, and we're talking about the prophetic, it's the same thing. It's got to be for edification. So it's not about us, it's about him and it's about edifying others. So again, we've got to get over ourselves. Do you know, I have a guy who, who's communicating with me online from another country, and every time I talk to him, he says, um, I have a church approaching 4,000 people. Now that's great, except if that's what makes him successful, then that's not what the kingdom's about. Do you know, if our church grows to you know, 200, 2,000, whatever, you know, it's still about walking humbly before God and man. Amen. It's still about serving God and man. Amen. It's still about, you know, being Christ-like. And it's not about promoting ourselves. It's about honouring Him and advancing His kingdom. Amen. You see, it's not about the numbers. It's about Him. Amen. 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 So true. It's not about how we look. It's about Him. Amen. It's funny how He made Himself of no reputation, but we all want to have such a big reputation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can I keep going? Yes. Keep going. <laughs> One of the things about laying new foundation is sometimes you've got to clear the block and get all the rubbish out from even from under the surface. <laughs> so that's part of the grace of my life. So if you can understand that, you'll know where this, all this stuff comes from. I'm not trying to not trying to be critical or any of that stuff. The fact is that God's in the business of transitioning us into a whole new season so that we're a genuine expression of His kingdom. That means He's going to start digging under the surface because He wants to get some boulders and you know some, some stumps and stuff out of the soil so that He can lay a new foundation. And unfortunately for me, it's part of the grace He's put on my life. <laughs> I'd love to have one of those other graces that just makes people feel good all the time, you know? Call me to be a pastor, you know? What's with that? Because <laughs> pastors make people feel good all the time, don't they? Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, I know you didn't come to, to, to have someone be all pastoral over you, so. Uh, and, and, and here's the thing God's reordering our thinking. He's reordering our understanding. And, um, you know, and so, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes I go places and, and I know I'm going to say what God's told me to say. But I cringe on the inside thinking, God, you know. And afterwards I think, I'm never going to be invited back. But you know what? It's amazing. They invite me back. <laughs> but see, it's about grace. Again, if I'm, if I'm doing this out of my own heart and my own motivation or whatever, then there's not going to be a grace on it. And again, you've got to be discerning. You know? We do. We all have to be discerning. Amen. Yeah. All right, so... Here it's all about edification. So let's talk about this. Firstly, prophecy is to build people up. That's what edification means, to build them up. All right? So let's go back to verse 3. Because there's three things here um, very clearly about building up people and building up the church. Firstly is um, the word edification means to build up, strengthen, add to, promote spiritual growth for the individual, the church, the body of Christ. So that's what... Edification means, all right, to, to build people up to, to strengthen them, to value add to their lives. So, again, prophecy is not about saying things that people want to hear or that's going to make them feel good. That's right. It's actually about strengthening them. That's right. So there might be the occasional statement in there that, that makes them kind of go, huh, really? You know? <laughs> but if our motivation is to strengthen, them, strengthen people and value add to their lives, then at some point... That statement is going to actually do that in their lives. I remember years ago I was planning a, a church in Wollongabba and um, a friend of mine who was uh, on the team of a large church out west of the city um, came into Brisbane for a, something or other and on his way out he stopped in at our office and um, he stopped in to have, say hello, have a coffee and whatever and, and we, we just talked and all that and, and, um, and then he said, um, listen I've got to go but why don't we pray before I go? I said, yeah, let's do that. So he starts to pray, and as soon as he starts to pray, God just kind of gives me a video of his life. And time frames. Now that's scary stuff. So when he finished praying, I said, mate, um, I hate this, but I've got to tell you this. You know? And I said, I don't know what it's going to mean to you. And you know, um, you may want to stone me afterwards, but I've got to tell you this anyway. <laughs> 
I said, within six months you're going to be running your own church. And on and on, you know. All this stuff, time frames. He said, well, he said, we're very happy where we are and haven't even thought about running your own church. He said, I don't know what to do with that. He said, I guess all we can do is put it on the shelf and see what God does. A few months later, they went on holidays. While they were away, they were asked to preach in a particular church. When they got there, they found out there wasn't a pastor there, and they asked him if they'd become the pastor. <laughs> His first Sunday was one week inside six months. <laughs> but you know, when I spoke that stuff, he was like, man, that's from left field, you know. Yeah. You know? But it was to add something to his life, right. which then over time, because he was wise enough to say, well, if this is God, God will do it. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it happened. Now, that's been one of the most amazing experiences in the prophetic that I've had. But, you know, there can sometimes be a bit confusion if you don't <coughs> understand that God's a God of process. He's not, a, not always an instant God. That's right. Yeah, there's instant healings, instant deliverances, etc., etc. But all of those things are events in a process that God's Amen. going to rise on. Amen. And we need to see that, how events fit into process. Yes. Otherwise, we just always chase events or believe everything is an event. Yes, yes. Or everything should be instant. But there are times, you know, when God just kind of holds back some stuff. Because mm. mm. he's got process to work on. Amen. But then there comes the suddenlies of God. You can't chase the sudden ways, but you can sure enjoy them when they come. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah? And so God's events or sudden ways are parts of his process. And if we see it like that, then we'll understand when we go to a meeting somewhere and our heart's going, man, I wish that person had a word for me. That would be wonderful. And it doesn't happen. It's okay because we're in God's process. But then when we're in a meeting somewhere and... Out of the blue, you get called out and this great word gets spoken over your life and you go, wow, that's out there, you know? That's part of the process. Either way, we're in a process in God. And so the, the events, the whatevers. And so if, if, it's, if prophecy is about building people up, then we can understand that there are going to be things that we won't always be able to understand and you know, know on the time, or how it fits or how it works. But God's got a process. Yeah. And if our motivation in prophesying is to strengthen, to add to, to build up, to promote spiritual growth, etc., then we're going to see that, well, we, we can wait. We can put this thing on the shelf. You know? We, we can trust God with it. And, and if we know that the person prophesying is genuine, both by discernment and by the fruit of their lives and ministries, then we can say, well, okay, Lord, if this is you speaking, then I'm just going to keep being led by your spirit and, and I'm going to be waiting to see how you're going to do this. But when we prophesy to people, we need to understand this too because we need to help them to process the things that God speaks to them through us. Yes, yes, yes. We need to have a word of wisdom for them as well yeah. as a word of prophecy yep. sometimes. You know what I'm saying? All right. So uh, then the next one in, in the, this whole area of building people up is exhortation. It means an appeal, to appeal to someone. All right? It means to issue a call. It means to urge someone to pursue a particular course. So this is more than just adding value adding and, and strengthening and promoting spiritual growth. This is a bit more specific. And there's a little bit more um, uh, little bit more interactiveness about it. And the reason I say that is because uh, this actually relates to one of the Holy Spirit's names, which in the Greek is paraclete. Yes. The one called alongside to help. He is our exhorter. That's really what it means. Yeah. So he not only builds us up, he not only strengthens us, he not only adds value to our, our lives and our ministries, he not only promotes spiritual growth and maturity in us, but he also gets up close and personal. And he, go, and he goes, come on, let's go this journey together. That's it. Come on, you, today this is you know, the thing you've got to do. You know, this is yeah. how you have to, have to go. Um, and so he appeals to us. He issues a call to our hearts, doesn't he? He, uh, he urges us to pursue certain courses. Mm. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what the exhortation part of the prophetic does. And it's part of building people up because sometimes people lack motivation themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And so they need an exhorter. They do. Now this is not bashing someone over the head. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also not putting a chain around their neck and dragging them. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the Holy Spirit's about partnership. It's, it's part of our covenant relationship with God. 
And so it's about love for one another again. Yeah. It's about that relational thing, that covenant bond. Yeah. And in that, we what does it say in Hebrews? We stir one another up to love and good works. Yes. And yes. that's part of the yes. prophetic. So yeah. the prophetic's not just to strengthen and add value and you know and promote spiritual growth and maturity, but in the building up part of the prophetic, it's also about appealing to a person prophetically. Yeah. You know, inspired by the Holy Ghost. It's about issuing a call. Woo. It's a bit like the Holy, what the Holy Spirit did with John in Revelation, where yeah. the heavens opened and a voice said, come up here. Yeah. Issued a call to come out from where he was yeah. to something yeah. somewhere else. You yeah. know? It's about urging to pursue. Yeah. Now, obviously, this is, can't be just out of our own heart or imagination. It's got to be, you know, the prophetic is about the Holy Spirit's inspiration. But when the Holy Spirit inspires us, if we've got that kind of relational connection, then we stir one another up to love and good works prophetically. What a powerful thing. Man, there's safety and security in this, isn't it? You know, there's, there's a, a sense of stability and depth and, you know, and whatever in this kind of stuff because all of a sudden, this is not just people just running around, you know, getting all excited about the ex exercising of gifts. Yeah. Yeah. This is about that we're on a journey together yeah. for the king and to advance his kingdom and, and, and he's got a purpose and, and in the prophetic, we can actually en encourage which means we build up and we appeal to. Come on, come with me. Come on, you know, I feel this is what God's saying. Let's, let's do this together. What a powerful thing. Then the third one is encouragement. In the King James it says comfort, but um, because of the way I structure my stuff, I've got to have three E's. You all know that. Yep. Right? <laughs> but actually encouragement is what comfort is about. It means consolation, solace, comfort, Soothing regarding a trial or difficulty being experienced. Do you know there is an encouragement that comes purely out of love for one another yeah. and care for one another? Yeah. But there is an encouragement that comes prophetically from the Holy Ghost. That's so true. And that's a different dimension that's of encouragement. What we need. We need that. And, and, and we need to encourage one another because we love one another. Yeah. But then if there's if we're if we're a prophet or if we have a prophetic part of our lives, uh, then then we need to also be open to that inspiration of the Holy Ghost that's going to put encouragement in people's lives. Because yeah. when the pressure's on, then to um, to have a, prof a a word that you know that that just simply makes a person feel like, hey, yeah, it's okay, can be very important. Yeah. Yeah. Can be very important. Awesome. And um, we need, uh, even though we have a prevailing spirit, we are more than conquerors. You know, and, and, and those of you from the Garpe Church, you know, you hear this stuff all the time because I believe it's uh, the DNA of the kingdom. Yeah. It, it's part of our genetic makeup in the kingdom. But the fact is that despite that, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak sometimes. That's right. And that's why God has given us this, not only in our love for one another, but also in the, in the prophetic ministry. So that we prophetically speak encouragement. Why? Because the prophetic word is like a fire. Oh, and the prophetic word is like a hammer. In other words, the, the, the natural you know, love of God encouragement is good, but, and, you know, and it makes us feel comfortable and feel comforted and so on. But the prophetic comfort, the prophetic encouragement is actually going to shift us. It's going to lift us. Yeah? It's got power greater than just the encouragement because we love one another. Yes. But put the two together and what a package. Yes. Because we love one another and because it's prophetically inspired, yes. man, it doesn't matter what we're going through, it's going to shift us and lift us. Yes. Amen. 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 And I can testify to that. Yes. You know, we've, you know, Judy and I have had to deal with, a, well, now five deaths this year. I've got to tell you, it kind of, you know, you start to think, well, okay, you know, okay. <laughs> and we know we have this prevailing spirit and there's something inside us that simply won't lie down, you know. Because when you've got the revelation of this, that this is the DNA of the kingdom, it's our genetic makeup, you cannot deny your gen genetic makeup. You know, I'm a redhead. Mm -hmm. I have Viking heritage. Mm -hmm. I can't deny it. I can crucify it, but I can't deny it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but on the positive side... <laughs> All of that has to submit to the fact that I'm a new person in Christ. Amen. I have new DNA. Amen. I'm of my Father in heaven. Amen. I have a new genetic makeup. Amen. And so therefore, I don't just naturally encourage, 
but I need to have a different dimension that comes out of my genetic makeup. Amen. And you know, the prophetic it activates that stuff. Amen. It really does. It activates it. And so, and, and what a combination if we, because we love one another, that's our motivation, but also then we naturally want to build each other up, yeah. strengthen each other, yeah. Yeah. value add, yeah. you know, help each other yeah. you know, come to maturity, stir one another up to love and good works, appeal and call, issue a call and, and say, come on, you know, let's, let's pursue this course together in God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we want to then give comfort and strength and all that. But you know, there, there is this other dimension that when the, the heat is really on and we know that we've got this, this DNA in us and, and the spirit is willing but the flesh gets weak, then I want to tell you something. When there's the, the prophetic angle of this as well as the natural angle put together, man, it shifts you and it lifts you. It does. Amen. Amen. And you know, we need this in the prophetic. We do. Because this is how God wants us to edify. Shift and lift. Shift and lift. Alright. <laughs> Let's get the t-shirt. <laughs> Alright, so we're doing okay? Yeah. I'm getting a bit fired up, so look at it. <laughs> Alright, number two. In this whole area of edification, the purpose of the prophetic is to break through. Right, to build up, but also to break through. Let's go to verses 24 and 25. And um, it says, If all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in. Interesting turn of phrase, eh? interesting words. An unbeliever or an uninformed person. Do you know we have both categories today? Just like back in the early church. We have unbelievers, and we have uninformed believers. Mm. We have people who don't know anything about the kingdom because they're not in it. We have people who are in the kingdom who don't know what it's about. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Alright? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here's what it says, that prophecy is for them. It's to actually break through in their lives. Mm. Right? And this is part of the whole edification thing. So it says that for prophecy is for unbelievers and the uninformed. Why? Because... These people will then become convinced, they'll be convicted, the secrets of their hearts will be revealed, they'll fall on their faces, they'll worship God, and they'll report God's among you. Yeah. Do you know prophets should be amongst unsaved people? Yes. That's what I read out of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there's a breakthrough dimension in the prophetic for the unsaved. We need prophetic people to be flowing in their gifting and calling and anointing and grace outside of the four walls of church meetings. Amen. Because within the body we edify, but there is a breakthrough dimension that's needed outside. Amen. That the prophetic provides, that is different from what apostles might provide and what evangelists might provide out there. It's a different grace. But there is something about the prophetic grace that impacts people's lives, those who are unbelievers. Yes. And also those who are uninformed. In other words, Christians who are ignorant of these things. And there's lots of them out there, you know, because the church has been institutionalized for a long time. And so in, in the early church, there was the people who were godly people and the, the Judaistic people and so on. And, um, but they were uninformed about the things of the kingdom. So they were godly, loved God, worshipped him. But they're uninformed. And then, of course, there's the Gentiles who just were the unbelievers, you know. And so we have the same thing today. And so I think we need to, um, in this whole area of edification, come to an understanding how the prophetic actually edifies the uninformed and even unbelievers. And it's, it's edifies by bringing a breakthrough in their lives. Mm -hmm. So there's five things here. Firstly, they're convinced. The prophetic will cause them to have a realization of the truth and reality of God and his purposes, who he is and what he's about. Secondly, they'll become convicted. This actually means that they'll come under scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the squirming the seat stuff, you know? <laughs> Not mentioning any name. No. <laughs> 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 <laughs 
I just, no, I just saw the manifestation. <laughs> <laughs> it's alright mate, I know, I know I'm still over it, it's all good. <laughs> but that, that's really what it means. So firstly they'll, they'll have a realisation, revelation will come, that's what being convinced is. And they'll realise the truth of who God is and His reality and His purposes, you know. Something will dawn on them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then, but then their hearts will come under scrutiny, that's what conviction's about. Right? And they'll, they'll know that there is a, a God who not only loves them but also one day is going to judge them. They'll know that not only does God offer so much in salvation and in His kingdom, but that He's going to hold us accountable one day. Mm. Amen. Right? And so they'll come under that kind of scrutiny. The light of God will shine and expose stuff. Yeah. Now this doesn't sound like edification, does it? It is. But it's part of the process of building up people's lives and the things of God. All right? Number three, they'll feel conspicuous. Have you ever had that feeling? Walking to a meeting, God's, work, God's moving us like... Ooh, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone looks at you and you think, man, what are they seeing? <laughs> <laughs> and they don't even know what's going on, you know? <laughs> yeah, but you know, where there's the prophetic amongst unbelievers and the uninformed, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. They're going to start to feel conspicuous. They'll feel exposed. See, the, the secrets of their hearts are revealed. So what's been hidden, suddenly they feel all. Oh, God knows this. Yeah. Maybe this person knows this. And so they, they have to then make a choice about dealing with that stuff. You know? And it says uh, they'll know the secrets of their hearts are known to God and that they must respond to Him. Yeah. All right? You see, we, we think that the people who should be out amongst the uns unsaved are evangelists. They're only one of the people. That's it. Firstly, we as believers, all of us, are supposed to be actually shining a light out there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because yeah. the kingdom's in us, so wherever we are, the kingdom's there, we're a mobile embassy of the kingdom. Amen. So therefore, we're all supposed to make an impact out there, right? Amen. But then God's given these five gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and all of them actually have a particular facet to add to yes. yeah. impacting out there, you know, whether it's the unbelievers or the uninformed. How prophetic people do that is what we're talking about right now. And um, But that means that you're going to need somebody else, you know, another gift or two to work with, because sometimes, you know, when the prophetic starts to really impact like this, people don't feel edified, <laughs> even though it's part of God's edifying process. And you see, people tend to respond to their feelings rather than reality, yes, because if we don't understand God's processes, and unbelievers and uninformed don't understand God's processes, true? But where, where, where this starts to happen, you may need a pastor around. Do you know, because of the kind of grace that's on my life, I do a lot of things with one of our pastors. Because they just soften me. They just add what I can't, don't have. You know? And it's so important. But guess what? I'll hit stuff that they will back away from. Which releases people. <laughs> that's, see, this is why we need each other. You know? So we're not all pastors. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. Your pastors are wonderful people, but thank goodness we're not all you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Do you know the thing about the kingdom is that when we really discover our calling, then we find our identity, then we become comfortable in our skin. Spiritually speaking, we accept who we are there. And then you don't have to be pressed into somebody's mold. Don't fulfill other people's expectations or the expectations of past church structures and way of doing it or anything like that. We, we all need to know who we are in God. Not just as a believer, but yes, our call. Because that's our identity. Yeah. When you know your identity, then you're secure. Yes, and then you can, you can actually say, well, I've got this, but I don't have this, and I need people around me with that. True. And then other people are going to be going, I've got this, but I don't have this, I need you around me. You know? And together... God can cause us to make a huge impact for His kingdom, amen? Yeah. So they're convinced, they're convicted, they feel conspicuous, but then they, they're constrained. They fall, fall on their face to worship God. In other words, they come to a place where it's like, hey, I have to, I have to give up. I have to let God do, because I, I, mm -hmm. the reality of who He is and His purpose in my life has hit home. Um, I, I sense His scrutiny of my life. I, I feel my, uh, my heart being exposed. And I know there's stuff that's got to change. And so the only thing I can do is just surrender to Him. Amen. 
This is the role of the prophetic. True. It's brilliant, isn't it? Mm. And then they'll confess. They'll report that God is truly among you. Right? That they will that they'll go away or, or continue in the things of God and they'll honor God. So what's happened? They've come into the kingdom. Or if they're already in the kingdom but aren't informed, they've come into a fullness of the kingdom, if you will. Mm-hmm. What a great thing. This builds people's lives up from the, from the point of view of that, that they were at the mercy of the enemy or at the mercy of the bondage to sin or they're at the mercy of ignorance of the things of the kingdom and yet the prophetic actually then brings them out of darkness into the light of the kingdom so that then they can be who God's called them to be. What a great way for people's lives to be edified. Amen? Amen.